Hey there, this is Ill Factor from BeatAcademy.com. In this video, I'm going to be doing a crash course into Ableton Live 10, covering everything you need to know and how to use the program to create the music you want to create. So by the end of this video, you will actually learn how to use Ableton Live, sequence in it, record audio, and share your music with the rest of the world. As my gift to you for watching this video, I'd love to send you a sample pack that I've created from some of my projects over the past year. This sample pack includes construction kits, loops for different types of genres that you can use in any DAW. And it's 100% royalty free, so feel free to use it in any of your projects today. Simply click the link below in the description box and download your Beat Academy sample pack. It's yours absolutely free. So, let's dive right in. Now Ableton Live primarily works in two environments. You have your arrangement view, which is a typical linear view in which you build out your arrangement of the song. And then you have session view, which is where you can go ahead and control the overall balance and mix of that song and project you're working on. We're going to start here in the session view and work our way back to the arrangement view. And you'll see why, because the session view, especially in my workflow, is what makes Ableton Live a bit more unique than other DAWs in the sense that we're going to treat the session view as a sketch pad for our ideas and just focus on coming up with the overall general vibe. And then once we have that in place, we can go ahead and transfer it over to our arrangement view. So it's kind of in the sense of create, come up with the overall idea and what really feels good, and then get that idea and then start flushing it out into an arrangement. So let's get the lay of the land here. Let's get familiar with some of the parameters that we see in this environment. On the top left hand corner, you have a tap tempo button. This is really helpful for you to just kind of get a general ballpark idea of the tempo you're looking for or that you, you feel like creating in and just simply tap that tap tempo, one, two, three, four, and then the project will generalize that tempo and you, you see the play button already starts. So the project will immediately start after you've tap tempoed. And so this is really helpful to kind of get more or less the, the overall feel and the tempo and more in that ballpark of the, the BPMs you wanna work in. And obviously next to that tap tempo is your global BPM, the basic beats per minute, the, the tempo of your project. You can simply click, drag up and down. You can also double click and just input whichever number you'd want. Double clicking it will take it default to 120 BPMs. And then you can go ahead and input whichever BPM you want. Next to it, you have the nudge down and the nudge up buttons. Now these are very unique to Ableton Live being that the whole premise of building this DAW was centered around live performance, meaning that artists might even use Ableton Live for a live performance aspect. And so the nudge down and the nudge up make it really cool to allow you to basically speed up the project tempo and then have it snap immediately back to the tempo you're at just so that you can somewhat beat match or catch up to maybe a drummer that's just off time or, or a singer who's just off beat and you're performing uh, with Ableton Live on stage. Let me give you an example. I'm gonna turn the metronome on so you can hear the beat. Now, with the metronome on, I'm simply going to click and drag, uh, click and hold the nudge down button. And then let go of it and it'll snap right back to 150. I'll do the same thing with the nudge up. So it's just a really quick way to nudge up and down the tempo without actually having to change the global tempo here. It's pretty useful for live performances. Then next you have your time signature. 4-4, four, four, you can set it to whichever time signature you'd like to work in. Right next to that, as you can see, that's our metronome. Let's us know the beat that we're keeping. But right next to the metronome, you can click and you have a specific count in, which is really helpful when it comes to recording. Now, I don't want to immediately record the second I hit the record button, so I want to give myself about a one bar count and then I record. So that gives me a one, two, three, four, and then record. You could set it to two bars, or if you're bedroom studio and, and you have your microphone down the hallway, you can set yourself four bars so that you can hit the record button, run down the hall, jump over the, the, the clothes that are on the floor and start recording the vocals. And then right underneath, you can actually change the, the sound of that metronome. You have the classic, the click, and a wood block. Then you can also set the subdivision too. 
So this is really helpful. Ableton Live 10 has introduced this. Uh, the earlier versions didn't let you choose the subdivision. So this makes it really helpful. So we're at 150. And I can set it to every eighth note so that I can hear the metronome in double time. You can also have the feature to enable only while recording, which is really helpful, especially when you're tracking vocals. Down the road, you want to just leave it there so that when you're ready to record, you can hear the click in your headphones only when you're recording and not upon playback. So you don't have to go back and forth and click in the metronome on or off. Next to the metronome, you have what we call the global quantization. This is going to come in handy and useful later on as we explain how this impacts other elements in Ableton Live. Now, right underneath is the browser window. Now, the browser window is not only used to locate instruments, plugins, effects, and sounds, but it's what you're going to be using to create the right type of workflow that allows you to hit the ground running with that creative spark of an idea. So, right at the top, we have what we call collections. Collections allows you to browse anywhere within the browser, find something that you like, bookmark it, and categorize it by color. So I have some drum one hits that I like when I browse um, some folders of mine in my hard drive. I can simply right click it and choose the color that I like for the collection. You can rename them by right clicking and then hit rename. You can also add a sound or patch or preset or plugin into multiple collections. So this one's in the drums, one hits, uh, pop slash hip hop. I can also put it in the yellow category. If I wish to name yellow something like great 808s or something like that. On the right, you see the results. So you can also add plugins, whether they're third party or presets or plugins that come with Ableton Live. You can also find samples or loops and just categorize them the way you like it. So collections is a powerful way where you can bookmark specific sounds that you like to use on a regular basis. That way you're not wasting time browsing and, and looking for those things. Underneath the collections, you have categories. Categories is broken into sounds and they've pretty much broke it down into different types of sounds, bass, drums, effects, brass. And these are all patches that you can use for proprietary instruments that come with Ableton Live. So these are all just <laughs> instruments that you can immediately use by just locating the sound, clicking it and getting started right with right away with that sound. You have drums for the different drum rack and different drum kits, instruments, all the different instruments that come with Ableton Live 10, your audio effects, which you can use on all the, all the tracks that you'll be using. Um, now, just because it says audio effects doesn't mean you can't use it on MIDI tracks. Audio effects are things that you might use on a MIDI track if the MIDI track is hosting a third-party plugin. We'll talk more about that later. MIDI effects which allow you to actually alter the MIDI data, Max for Live, which now comes installed with Ableton Live 10. So Max for Live is another host of uh, plugins that you can use within your projects. And a lot of these are great because they're open source. So that means that you can, people have been uh, creating their own devices that they want to go ahead and use in the Ableton Live world. So these are great to have as an addition. Plugins which would be your third-party plugins that you might have installed from third-party plugins, such as Waves or UAD, or anything like that, you will find them in here. And if you don't see any plugins show up here in your VST or audio, simply head over to your preference window and head over to File and Folder and make sure in the plugin sources that you've turned on Use VST Plugin System Folder or uh, you can browse for specific custom folders that you've created and use audio units. Make sure that those two are enabled so that you can now install or enable and have activated all the, UA, the audio units and VSD plugins that you have installed in your computer. Underneath plugins, you have clips that come with Ableton Live that basically act as loops that you can use in your sessions. And then samples, basically straightforward audio samples and audio files that you've collected. Then you have underneath that packs, these are sample uh, packs with instruments loops and things like that that ableton has directly from their online store that connects through your ableton live account so you can just immediately download it directly from here and install it your user library is self-explanatory it's what you've created and presets that you might have have and saved away so you can access them there 
and all the things about the current project you're working on will be found here. Now, Places also allows you to bookmark specific folders on your hard drive so that you can access them at any time by just visiting the browser window. Simply go down and hit the Add Folder button, browse your computer hard drive, select the folder that you want, and simply hit Open. And it will add it to the Places sidebar so you can have access to them all the time. This makes it really efficient when trying to look or locate sounds so that you can use in your project. You can also use the search menu here on the top of the browser, which is such an amazing helpful tool to locate specific files inside your places and presets and plugins as well. So let's say I'm looking for a sound that sounds like uh, a bird. Well, I can type in bird and since this Beat Academy sample pack folder is highlighted, it's filtering out any samples with the word bird in it. Since there are none, none show up on the right side. But let's go over here to all results and let's see all the files with the word bird in them. And these are all the files that show up. The search field is a helpful tool when trying to locate a specific sample that you might be looking for, which you know the file name of, or if you're just actually looking for a specific type of sound and don't necessarily know where that file might be. So you can type in, you know, bass fuzz and things like that, and you will find patches and presets with that same two words, bass and fuzz in them. So now let's go ahead and create an instrument so we can begin sequencing and creating an idea. I'm simply going to right click in the session view and choose to insert a MIDI track. This is going to allow me to have a track in which I can load an instrument on there and triggering it with my MIDI device or even step sequence. Now we have an audio track and we'll come back to it and I'll show you how you can incorporate audio, whether recording your own audio or incorporating loops into your project. For right now, let's just go ahead and focus on the MIDI track. The MIDI track is what's going to allow us to trigger different instruments such as drum kits, and synthesizers, or any third-party plugins that you might have. Now without anything loaded on this track, we can trigger it, meaning click the record button, the record enable button on this track, and you can see the MIDI data coming from my MIDI device but you don't hear anything. And that's because focusing your attention on the bottom window, there are no instruments or devices loaded on this track. So let's head over to the category section, choose drums, and in this drum section, we're gonna choose a drum kit. This is a drum rack loaded with drum sounds already. You can simply click and drag this over the pre-existing MIDI track, or you can simply click and drag it anywhere in the session view and it will create a separate MIDI track with the device already loaded in there. Or you can simply double click and it will load that instrument on the current MIDI device that you have selected. So for instance, I'll click on that first MIDI track we created, double click 808, and now we have the 808 drum kit loaded on both this one and this one. So let's just go ahead and stay with this one here. Now, if you focus your attention to the top of the MIDI instrument, you'll notice these little individual squares and boxes. These are called clip slots. Each individual clip slot is what you'll probably think of as an idea. And that's what we're going to treat them as. Let's treat these clip slots as ideas. You'll notice that the MIDI instrument here, this 808 core kit, has circles in it, and the audio track here has squares. And that's because the MIDI instrument, this MIDI track, is record enabled meaning that we've triggered the record button and it's enabled and it's turned on, meaning that we're ready to record. We can trigger it with our MIDI device or with our computer keyboard. So now let's go ahead and record an idea. With my metronome on, I can simply just click any clip slot, trigger the record button and start to record. and hit stop when I'm done recording. As you can see here, here's that idea that we've just recorded. I can double click and it will open up the MIDI editing window on the bottom. I can toggle between the device that I'm actually triggering by, by holding shift and tab. There's the drum rack that we have with the sounds and hitting shift tab again to see the actual notes in this individual clip. Now, once I've recorded this clip, I can move it, place it anywhere in the clip slot doesn't necessarily mean that it has to stay where I've recorded it. But now I've double clicked this 
and I can go ahead and edit the notes that I've recorded and simply move them to wherever it is I want within the grid. That's me recording using my MIDI device. I can also record by drawing in the notes without using any external MIDI device. I can do this by just simply double clicking an empty clip slot like this and it will give me by default a one bar clip. In that one bar clip we can simply go into the MIDI editing window and simply double click to drag in notes and place them wherever it is that we want within the grid. So once again let's go ahead and draw in some notes. So we've created a one bar empty clip and we're simply going to double click inside that MIDI wet editing window and draw in those notes. To audition the sound so you can hear when you place the notes, make sure that the headphone mode is enabled. Without it, you would be able to just draw the notes and not hear what the sounds are, are being triggered. So I'll go ahead and place this on different places in the grid. Now the grid is basically how we can align the notes that we're inserting with the time or the overall tempo. See, this is one bar. So we have bar one, beat two here, beat three, and then beat four, and then we're introduced to bar two if we extend this out. So for right now, we're only dealing with one bar. So if I want to audition this clip, just simply hit the play button that is now on the left side of the clip, and that auditions and lets you trigger and listen to the clip. Now, the grid is important because that's the timing. So if you didn't have a grid, it would be really hard to have everything lock up in the right rhythm. So you could set the grid in different ways. You can right click in the MIDI editing window and you can use the adaptive grid or the fixed grid. The fixed grid basically says, I want to quantize or I want every note to be able to land on the nearest 16th note. Or you could set it to every quarter note. And you can see how now we lose a lot of the gray lines here and we only see a gray line at every quarter note. Bar one, beat two, three, and four. So that means when I double click a note now, the length of that note becomes a whole quarter note. If I right click on the grid again and choose eighth note, we now have a subdivision. So if I double click, it's now the length of an eighth note and so on and so on. If I had one bar, it'll cover the whole bar. So your notes, when you double click them, will determine on the actual grid that you have currently set up. We'll highlight all this and just simply hit delete. That's the fixed grid. So it will always stay to whatever it is that you have it set to. Now, you can also choose the adaptive grid, which allows a little bit more flexibility because you can change the grid value determining on how much you zoom in and out. So for instance, let's use narrow. And when I hover my mouse above this yellow line here, it turns into a magnifying glass. I click and drag up and down and more grid markers appear because I'm going a little bit deeper within the subdivision. So if I double click and I zoom out, it's a lot shorter note. So if I wanted to get more precise in my timing, I can zoom in and I can go ahead and choose narrow, narrowest, medium. And then the more I zoom in, the more grid lines I see. And then when I zoom out, the less I see. And you can work your way back to wide and widest. So this is really going to depend on your personal workflow and how you like to sequence and be able to change your grid. You could also use your pencil tool by hitting the B key. And this allows you to draw repetitive notes. Instead of having to double click each time to draw in notes to fill this whole beat with four individual notes, you could use the pencil tool, just click once and drag to the right, and it will repeat that note. Also, you have to understand that the note gets repeated according to the grid value. So if you've got this set to every 30 second note, you're able to draw twice as much. Every quarter note, just one. So the pencil tool is really helpful when needing to repeat notes. So we'll go ahead and delete that. And now we play what we have. So let's go ahead and instead of having quarter note hi-hats, let's go ahead and have eighth note. 
And I can use the pencil tool to draw over that and just Now, so far, what we've been doing is step sequencing, literally drawing in step by step the notes directly on the grid itself. But when it comes to recording using an external MIDI device, you might not always land on the grid because you're introducing a human element to it. So I'm going to record a beat performed on my external MIDI keyboard, and we'll cover how to actually quantize and get the notes played as close as possible to the grid so that it just doesn't fall off time. So I'm going to leave what I've just done here in that first clip and we'll go to another empty clip slot, choose the record button and record. So there's the idea. And if we look at it, we can zoom in and notice that some of the notes aren't directly on the grid. As we look at the snare, we see that beat four is right here, but yet the snare is just a little behind. So there's a couple options. You can literally just click that one individual note and drag it, or you can select a group of notes by just clicking, dragging, and creating the area of notes you'd like to select, or holding Apple A to select all the notes, and choose Quantize Settings. So we can right click and head over to Quantize Settings. Quantizing is the ability to automatically have the notes move and shift to the grid that we've been working in. Now right here is quantize to, we can set it to every 16th note, so meaning that the nearest 16th value nudge that note, I mean adjust a note at the start, not at the end, or if you want to have the end of the note, meaning if you want the note to move to the right to the nearest 16th note, you would have it at the end. If you want the notes to move a little bit to the left, then you would put the start. Basically, the times you would use the start would be, hey, it sounded like I was behind the beat. So you basically want to have the notes adjust from the start, meaning you want the notes to move to the left. If you're, man, my, my notes were rushing, I played a little too fast, then you probably want to have the notes from the end move to the nearest 16th note. So I was behind the beat, I'm going to leave the start. Now the quantizing amount determines how strong the quantizing will take place on the notes selected. So let's do this. Let's set the quantizing to every quarter note. And let's set the amount to about 5%. So we hit OK. And there's barely any movement. These notes should have moved to the nearest quarter note, meaning they should have moved to the current lines of the grid that you see here but they didn't. Well, they did, but very little. So let's go to our quantize. Let's select all the notes again. And this time, we'll go to 100% and hit OK. Well, now they drastically moved to the nearest quarter note. So let's trigger this clip. And so you kind of get the idea. Having 100% set to your quantize settings will give you a a precise nudge to the nearest grid. So you can kind of play with the amount. If you want it a little bit more loose, you can kind of just dabble anywhere between, you know, halfway or if you want it to slightly just move, then you would lower the amount. If you want it to move drastically, you would raise the amount of the percentage when it comes to quantizing. Now you set the quantizing settings and once you have it set the way you like it, you can hit OK and then you could always do a short key command, which is just command U to apply those same quantize settings that you set. And every time you quantize from here on out, it will go back to the settings that you've currently left. Now I want to highlight a couple features in the notes section here that can be really helpful when sequencing and working with MIDI. So first, in the notes section, you'll notice that there's a dialog box that tells you the lowest note played and the highest note played in that clip. So we have C1, which is this kick here, and we have F sharp one, which is the hi-hat. So when we select all of them, the lowest note is C1, the highest one is F sharp one. Right underneath that, you have two buttons, divided by two and multiply by two. Divided by two allows you to play the clip twice as fast. 
even though we haven't changed the tempo. We're still at 108 BPMs, but the clip is just playing at cut time, twice as fast. Multiply by two does the opposite. It lets it play it twice as slow. So it's kind of cool to use as like a breakdown moment where you're going into half time and you don't really have to change the actual tempo of the project. And each individual clip is independent from another. So this clip, because it's now in halftime, doesn't necessarily mean that this clip is at halftime. It's the same way we created that clip. So now we can head over to the reverse and inverted buttons. Reverse would allow you just basically select whatever notes are selected. In this case, all the notes in this clip are selected. If I hit reverse, it would simply just reverse the sequence where the kick was first, then the snare, now we have the hi-hat, snare, kick. The hi-hats stay the same, well, because it's the same pattern whether you reverse it or not. An inversion will just basically flip. It'll take that note that's at F1 sharp, or F sharp one, and put it at the bottom, which would be the hi-hat, and it would put the note that's on the bottom, which would be the kick, where the hi-hat is. These are really cool, useful tools, especially when playing chords or recording uh, any melodic elements. You can really experiment with mixing these up and seeing what new results you would get. Legato allows you to connect one note to the next, basically taking the end of one note, extending it to it reaches the next following note. So I'll highlight the snare and kick and hit Legato, and basically the snare extended to where the kick is, and the kick if I hit legato there, will only extend to the nearest note that I've selected. So in this case, I didn't extend all the way out. But if I select the kick and snare and hit legato, that's what happens. Duplicate loop is a great use because it allows you to just duplicate the pattern that you've created in this clip. This clip, remember, is just one bar length. If I hit duplicate loop, now we have a two bar loop. Say if I wanted to change the pattern, maybe add another snare here. And you can also duplicate that loop again, giving you a four bar loop because we're duplicating two bars. So this is really helpful to get really nice intricate uh, program changes in your sequences because uh, now we can go ahead and do little drum fills and stuff like that right before certain things happen. And that'll spice things up a little bit. You can duplicate the loop again. Now it turns into an eight bar, 16 bar, and so on and so on. Another thing to consider is the loop playback. When the loop button is enabled, that basically turns the clip into a continuous playing clip. So it won't stop playing until you either stop the project or hit another clip. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But you can adjust the length or the amount that this clip will loop by going to the top right hand corner where the mouse cursor turns into a bracket clicking that and dragging both the loop bracket and the ending position to where it is that you desire so if we wanted to loop for one bar just drag it over to bar two now this clip will play in a loop for just one bar you can click that loop bracket and choose any specific one bar within the 16 bars that you've created. So let's say we want to loop from bar nine to 10. You can shrink the size of that. Now it's just half of that. Also to consider when the loop button is turned off, this now just becomes a one time played clip. So there it won't loop, but it will begin playing from wherever you determine the start position is. So right now, the start position is set at bar nine. Let's head back to bar one by clicking and dragging that over to bar one, and then going over to the end position and dragging that over to bar two. Now this is just a one bar clip and it should end playing as soon as it hits bar two. And that's it. So that's the difference between the loop bracket, which is the bracket you see on top here, and the start and end position. You can highlight a specific section, 
and say I would like to loop bar 3 and 4, hitting Command L, and that will automatically turn the loop button on and create the starting and end position and set the loop bracket to that highlighted bar length. Now that whole concept of treating clips as ideas, I hope that you're starting to see how this can play out. See now each individual clip will trigger a sequence or a pattern for that instrument that's loaded on that specific track. So we can have the beat that we have now and then create another beat underneath it in a different clip and have that play a whole different pattern and then go back to the original beat that we created. So this is great from creating just like maybe a verse idea and then oh, doing a variation and having a chorus idea or something like that. Different progressions, different beat patterns. So for instance, let's rename that first clip over here to verse 1. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead and duplicate it by just hitting Command D and that's going to do an exact copy. And what we'll do is for this one, we'll add some variation. So instead of an eighth note hi-hat, let's play a sixteenth note instead. Using the pencil tool, click and drag. So now we have a pattern with a sixteen hi-hat right here. And I'll rename that. I'll put sixteen. And we have the verse one idea. And I can go back and forth between the two. So you can see now that I can contain different versions, variations, uh, different lengths. Uh, this one clip can be, let's see, we hit the duplicate loop button several times. We can have a full 16, uh, 16 bar loop. But yet when I trigger the first clip, it immediately went to that clip. This is where the global quantization button comes into play. As you notice that button we talked about earlier is set to one bar. This determines when the next clip will be triggered. It will wait for the downbeat of the next incoming bar. For instance, if we set this over to four bars and I hit this clip here, you'll notice that the play button is flashing until the end of the four bar count. So now, I won't hear that first verse one beat until four bars have passed. If I want it to happen every two bars, I set the global quantization to two bars. Every eighth note, I'm able to re-trigger the clip, whether it's the same clip or a different clip, depending on the global quantization. Now, you can also, that's going to affect globally all the clips in your project. But then you can individually set at when that clip will get launched. And that is by enabling the launch menu down here. You will enable this and you can basically said, I don't want it to match the global quantization. I want it to follow its own rhythm. So when this trick went, I want this to be triggered in the next eighth note or the next quarter note. So you can individually set each clip to be triggered in the next quarter note or the next two bars or the next eighth note downbeat. So this is allowing you to independently make each clip launch at a different uh, launch point. But for right now, let's just set it to global so that it just follows what I do here. And I'll set it to one bar. So once again, treating this as a, a palette for ideas. So I'll have a, a different variation here. I might go ahead and copy this, duplicate this, and let's go ahead and click this and hit the twice as, you know, twice as slow. And now this will be playing at halftime. And then we can go right back to this one. And since they're all set to the loop button, there we, the, all the clips are going to continuously play until I trigger another one. Now, there's also a button here that will allow you to stop the clips that are currently playing on that specific track. So if we're playing the beat and we hit the stop button, that stops that clip from playing or any clips playing on this track. If you wanted two patterns to play at the same time, meaning I want 
this pattern to play and I also want that pattern to play. Well, that defeats the purpose of having different clips. If you wanted to, you would just basically copy whatever MIDI patterns you have in here by just highlighting them and hitting copy or Apple or Command C, going to the other clip and simply just pasting that data into the desired clip you want. So you can transfer that data so that you can hear that information when you press one clip. So, so far we've created different ideas and different patterns that trigger the device located on this MIDI track, which in this case is a drum kit loaded in a drum rack. Now let's see how we can incorporate the same concepts using audio. To create an audio track, simply right click and hit insert audio track or follow the short key command, command T. The difference between the two is with audio, you can not simply use a virtual instrument such as a synthesizer or a third party plugin directly onto the audio track. It only handles pre-recorded audio or audio that you're going to record into that track. So let's head over here to the interface, the IO section, because this is going to determine where the audio is coming from if we're planning to record audio into this track. Here we determine the input. Right now it's set to external in, meaning that I'm using my external sound card to determine the input I'm choosing to record. If you're using the stock sound card on your laptop, you might just have the option of one and two, the basic microphone that comes equipped on the laptop. If you're using an external device, depending on that device, you'll get to see the different inputs and outputs. Ableton Live also gives you the ability to label those inputs and outputs. You can do that in the preference window, choosing audio and input configuration. And here you can label what your inputs and outputs would be. Once you do that, you can go ahead and choose. In this case, here's input eight, my vocal mic. And if I want to record my vocal, I simply select that input and then hit the record button and record the same way right on the clip that we have with the MIDI patterns. Right underneath the input that you've chosen, you notice an in, auto, and off. That's your monitoring section. By default, Ableton Live have it set by default, Ableton Live has it set on off. And that's a good thing because what you, what happens is if input monitoring allows you to hear pretty much on standby mode, you're gonna hear what you're listening to or what it's gonna sound like before you record. But sometimes if you've got your speakers loud and the microphone close by, you can get a really nasty feedback. Almost sounds like transformers trying to escape your brain, something like that. So by default, it's set to off, meaning that you see the levels coming in, but you won't hear it. If you do want to hear your signal before you commit to recording it, you can then set it to auto. And auto would automatically let you hear it before you on standby mode. So while it's on auto, you can only hear the signal once you hit the record button. Once the record button is there, then you're able to hear the signal going through. Depending on your settings, you might experience some latency. So go back to your preferences in the audio section and configure the amount of the right buffer size for you that's going to allow you to work depending on your computer circumstance to get the least amount of latency, which is the time it takes for your uh, audio to travel through your computer and right out to the speakers for you to hear it. The smaller or the lower the buffer size, the less time it takes. So there's 6.60 milliseconds. The larger buffer size, that means it takes longer, but yet it's less CPU intensive. So you won't have a lot of memory issues. If you're getting a lot of crackling and popping, you might want to in try increasing the buffer size. If you're getting a lot of latency, try decreasing the buffer size till you get it where you can sound just right. Input monitoring allows you to hear it regardless whether you have the record enabled on or off. You're basically just hearing the input source. So in this case, we'll have it set to off because I don't need to hear myself. I'll hit the record button and we can simply just hit a clip and record it. Hey, how you doing? This is me recording audio. I sound great. 
And now by double clicking that clip, we now have an audio recording. And the same concept, you can just use this as a sketch pad. We'll get that down. I can choose another clip, record another idea, so on and so on. And each one can be its own independent length. One can be one bar, one can be 16 bars, 32, it doesn't matter. And you can add as many more clip slaps as you want. Just simply right click in here and hit insert scene. And that'll give you another row of clip slots that you can choose from. Now, as I mentioned before, audio tracks will allow you to record audio onto their tracks as well as import audio. So we have this recorded audio that we did earlier. Hey, how you doing? This is me recording audio. I sound great. You sure do. And then you can go ahead and import audio to that same very track. Even though we have my vocal that I recorded here, I can incorporate loops or different audio or MP3s, any type of audio file format and place it in that same track by just putting it in a different clip slot. So here we have a drum loop. I'll click and drag that over to this audio track. You can also click and drag it into the session view and a brand new audio track will be created with that track, with that audio loop on the track. So here, going back to that first audio, we have my vocal recording. Hey, how you doing? And then we have this audio loop. Both audio files are playing out of that same view. It's the same output of channel one or track one, audio one. So let's just rename audio one. We're going to hit rename and call this drum loops and I can go ahead and import several different loops click and hold shift and drag them right into that so now I have all these different loops all different loops different temples different vibes and I can trigger just like we did with the MIDI clips back and forth the different loops Because this one audio track contains multiple files or multiple clips that we can trigger back and forth. So let's play that MIDI clip earlier of the verse beat that we have. And now we can incorporate audio. We can incorporate audio alongside with this clip that's playing here. But there's something that you notice and that's the timing. So now we're going to get into manipulating and warping the audio that we're incorporating. Warping in Ableton Live is the ability to manipulate the audio you're using in your project. Just as the same way we were able to take these MIDI clips and adjust the notes timing by snapping them over to the grid, we can do so by warping the audio. You can even use warping as a method to spark creativity and create new sound designs and soundscapes with the audio that you're using. So let's go ahead and highlight the second audio file in this clip here in audio track one. Let's solo by clicking the S here so that this is the only track we hear playing and trigger that clip. So right now, this audio file, this clip here is not warped. The warp is disabled. And what we're listening to is just the audio file raw. So if we change the tempo of our project, 108, it will have no effect on the actual audio file. So the goal of warping this audio is so that the drum loop would be in time, whether we speed up or slow down the BPM of our project. Let's enable the warp button. And now we see the grid lines show up. And we also have these individual little markers show up at the beginning of every transient. These are our transient markers. So now that this file is warped, let's go ahead and speed up the tempo while this is playing. Now let's slow it down. So this is going to give us the ability to have that drum loop change with our project BPM. But you notice that we still have the timing issues. When I put the metronome on, the beat is behind. Now that an audio is warped, we can simply just click and drag and nudge each individual hit to where we want them on the grid. Now, I know what you're thinking, having to go in there and double click a marker and adjust every single hit by hand, that can be a little bit overwhelming, especially if you're dealing with larger files. So I want to share with you a three step simple process 
that can help you immediately warp the audio that you're importing or using and have it automatically line up to the grid. First, let's go ahead and disable the warp. The first thing you need to do when you're importing, whether a drum loop or song or any type of audio, you want to locate the downbeat. So that's our first step. In this case, we found our downbeat here to be this first initial kick. And your downbeat can be anywhere. You can locate it in any portion or part of the audio that you're using. So what, what I mean by locating is grabbing the starting position, just like we did with the MIDI editor, and this is going to determine where the audio starts. So if I have it from right here, that's where the audio starts when I trigger the clip. The grayed out area means that it will not play and it would just simply play right immediately from where the starting location is at. So what we need to do is move the starting location to our desired downbeat. In this case, by zooming in, I'm going to choose right here. So now when I trigger the clip, it's right at that initial kick drum. The next step is to simply right click on that starting position, right on the little triangle part right there, and then choose set bar one, beat one here. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna tell Ableton Live, this is where my downbeat, this is what I'm considering to be bar one, beat one. So we're gonna do that. Once I've done that, you already notice that Ableton Live will click the warp, it'll enable the warping, and it'll adjust the timing for the whole file. As you can see, we already have things lined up, with the exception of a couple little hits here and there, but then what we can do is simply right click on that first yellow warp marker and choose warp from here. There are a couple different options when it comes to warping, but if you start with the warp from here, that's going to allow Ableton Live to automatically warp calculating where you set your bar one, beat one. So we hit warp from here and you notice a little bit of adjustment, but now we have the drum loop in time. Let's go ahead and adjust our loop bracket. So I'm going to click this so that the loop starts from right here. Now, if I put my metronome on and adjust the tempo, we are now in time without having to go individually to any of the hits and adjust them. Now I can loop, let's say, bar three, or maybe just give me a two from bar one to bar three. We'll highlight that and simply click the loop button, or you can hit Command L. And that now gives us a two bar loop. Now we can go in there and adjust any timing that we want if we still feel that things are a little bit off. Maybe like the snare drum right here. Double click that and nudge that over. Keep in mind though, that this will adjust other parts of that file. So the way this works is you treat this warp marker as like an anchor point. Say from this sound to the next transient, I want to be able to adjust. So now, since there's no other warp marker to the left of this, everything to the left of this sound will be adjusted. So that's how you can use warping to even, even manipulate the rhythm of the audio. So if we bring this right back, and let's say I don't want this hit to move, I'll create a warp marker. So now that the only element that's moving is everything from this marker to this. So you can pretty much create like an anchor point saying, don't move that at all, I just want to move this one sound and so on and so on. So I can double click this, and now if I let go of that, everything after this warp marker will also adjust and move as well. As well. So we can now just move the placement of this one snare head while leaving everything else in the same place. You can also just select a whole group of transients and quantize them the same way you would quantize any MIDI notes. Head over to Quantize Settings, make sure that's the same, and hit OK. Then you might notice that Ableton Live has already highlighted, selected, and created yellow warp markers and shifted those transients to the nearest Quantize Settings. In this case, 
every 16th note. So that's a really cool, easy way to actually quantize the audio that you're using in your projects. Now, if we incorporated this by unsoloing it with the beat that we have on track two, they're now both in sync because we've manipulated and warped the audio so that it is now in time with the project. Now, going further with the warping, if you focus your attention to the warping section here, you notice that you have underneath the segment BPM. This is just Ableton Live's guess of the original BPM of the audio that you've warped. Then, just like in the MIDI editor, you can play it twice as fast or twice as slow. Now, underneath that, we have the warping mode. Depending on the type of mode that you're using is going to depend on the actual integrity or the quality or the actual type of effect that you're getting when warping. Beats is probably the mode you would want to use if you're manipulating audio such as drum loops or percussive elements, it's things that are easier to locate these individual transient hits. Then you have tones and textures, which are probably better for long played notes or strings or anything like that. And then you have repitch, which doesn't allow you to manipulate the quality of the warping, but adjusts the pitch of the audio according to your tempo. So for instance, the higher we go in our tempo, the higher in pitch. So it's still in time. It's just basically pitching up or down the, the audio so that it's in time with the project's BPM. This is the same thing as using a turntable or CDJ and pitching it up or down so that it can beat match with the other record. After repitch, you have things like Complex and Complex Pro. You have Complex and Complex Pro. These maintain the best possible quality and integrity of the audio. So these are probably best to be used when using vocals or long audio files in which you really want to maintain the integrity and quality of that audio file when doing big jumps. So if you're warping an audio file where the original BPM is, let's say, 92 BPMs, and you're trying to go from a 92 BPM audio loop and speed it up to 128, then you might want to try using the Complex Pro or Complex to maintain the best possible integrity. So you can have fun with using the different types of warping modes. They all have their own unique little texture and flair to them. And so just see what works best with the type of material and audio that you're manipulating. And now I briefly want to go through some of the instruments that you can use in your projects that come with Ableton Live 10. Head over to your instrument categories. And on the right side of the browser, you'll notice some of the instruments that are available. Some are pretty straightforward, such as synthesizers that you can use to generate tones and shape, leads, basses, pads, and you can do that using analog, collision, operator, and the wavetable, and tension. And in some, allow you to incorporate audio from projects or anywhere on your hard drive and manipulate them, such as the simpler, sampler, the impulse, and the drum rack. So let's go ahead and load a simpler. I'm going to click the simpler and drag and drop that into the session view. And that's going to create a brand new MIDI track with the simpler device loaded on it. Now, you can see that this area here is waiting for you to import a audio sample to work with. Now, you can use any file that you might have in your hard drive, as well as a file located within the project itself. So I'll use the audio clip that we've warped earlier. I'll just click that clip and drag it right into the simpler. Now you see the audio file located inside the simpler. So just by triggering it using a MIDI device or your computer keyboard allows you to play back the sound. And depending where you're playing on the keys of your MIDI device will determine the playback pitch. Now by adjusting the starting and ending positions within the simpler, you can determine where the sample begins to play when triggered. If you just click the starting position and drag that to wherever you like to start, that'll determine the starting point of the sample. You can click and zoom in by just dragging up and down. Same thing with the end position. Now the simpler comes in three different modes. You have your classic mode, which is the mode we're in now, 
which simply allows you to trigger the sample and pitch it up or down on your MIDI device. The one-shot mode, which still allows you to do that, but will play the sample once all the way to the end position. And then there's the slice mode within the simpler. This will create individual slices in the audio file using the transient markers. Each individual slice can be triggered and you can lower the sensitivity, spread the distance between one individual slice to the other. And they can all be warped so that each slice will play in time with the project. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the sampler. Click and drag the sampler into your session view. And the difference between the sampler and simpler is that the simpler allows you to manipulate one audio file at a time. Whereas the sampler allows you to combine multiple audio files and have them either play simultaneously or create a specific zone where that sample will be triggered. For instance, let's hit the zone button. <clears throat> and now we can simply drag and drop samples into this section. So I'll click the sample of my audio. That's one sample. We'll put the drum loop that we warped and we'll go ahead and place another one. So we've got three files. So if I trigger the sampler, hey, how you doing? This is me recording audio. and by clicking each zone, you get to see that specific audio file. Hey, how you doing? This is me recording audio. Now the green lines you see here just indicate the actual zone that that sample will be triggered in. So you can create a range saying, I only want to hear the sample when I play notes from C3 all the way to, let's say, C4. And you can design specific areas or zones for that specific sample to be played in. You can also just right click and hit distribute ranges equally and Ableton will automatically choose enough zones to fit the amount of samples that you have loaded in there. Next, let's take a look at the drum rack. The drum rack is similar to the sampler in which you can load multiple samples in there. Now, when you click and drag a sample, you can drag and drop any sample on your hard drive or even in the session, click and drag it. You notice that a simpler will pop up. The simpler will be the device that the drum rack will use to trigger back that sample. So everything that we went through with the simpler is basically what you're gonna be doing with every sound that you can load in a drum rack. Now you can load up 128 multiple samples on the drum rack and load up multiple drum racks within your projects. Another feature to note about the drum racks is the ability to map specific macro knobs so that you can control more than one sound's parameters in the simpler with just one knob. So let's say I have about five different sounds in my drum rack, but I want all of the transpose knobs of those sounds to be controlled by one knob instead of having to go to each individual sound and transposing it up or down individually. We can simply just go over here to the controls, right click on the transpose section and choose a macro to map it. So I'll map to macro one. Now, when I move the knob up and down on this macro, it's changing the transpose parameter. I can assign multiple samples to the same exact macro. This makes it really easy to control multiple samples at the same time by just turning one knob. Now let's talk about adding audio effects onto the tracks in your project. To add an audio effect, simply head over to the audio effects category and choose on the right side of the browser which effect you want to add to your track. So for instance, let's take this auto filter, we're going to click it and drag it on top of track seven. And now the auto filter shows up on the bottom. And now whatever we change on the auto filter will affect the audio on track seven. Now the signal flow works left to right. So if I add another plugin, such as maybe an EQ or a compressor, and then let's say a chorus, I can just double click. And since I have this track highlighted, it will continuously add more plugins to it. Whatever happens to the filter will affect the EQ and whatever I do to the EQ gets affected by the compressor. So it works from left to right. And if I wanted to change the chain of command, I simply just click on a plugin and shuffle it around. If I wanted the track to be affected by the chorus first, I would simply click the chorus and put that first in the chain. If I wanted the filter to be last, simply click the filter and have it become last. It does make a difference where the plugin is in the chain of the signal flow. In this case, the signal is being affected by the chorus 
and then the EQ, then the compressor, and then it gets filtered. Just because these are audio effects doesn't mean that they cannot be used on MIDI instruments. You can also just click, drag effects that are on an existing track, and drop them on another track, and that will remove that device over to the new track you placed it on. So here we have an analog, which is a synthesizer instrument, and we've now just placed a chorus on top of the analog. And the same things can apply from before. You can add multiple devices, as many as and as much as you want. You can even group the effects by holding the shift button, clicking the multiple effects, and right clicking and choosing to group them. What this would do will allow you to simply bypass multiple effects at once by just bypassing the actual group. Now, so far what we've been doing have been inserting devices or audio effects onto individual tracks, clicking an effect and dragging them directly onto that track. That's called insert effects. You can also place effects in return tracks, like we see here. There's a delay on return track A and a reverb on return track B. That corresponds to the knobs that we see here, send A and send B, which gives us the opportunity to just use one effect over multiple different tracks instead of having to use up our CPU resources by having multiple delays or multiple reverbs. We can simply just have one reverb or one delay and send a little bit of that signal from each individual track. So for instance, let's send a little bit of track seven to the delay. So we're sending a little bit of that audio signal to the effect that is placed on return track A. And you can layer and have multiple effects, as many as you want, directly on as many return tracks. To, re to create a return track, simply just right click and hit insert return track. The moment you create a new return track, you'll also create a new send. And then you can send over to that certain effect. So if we want a little bit of delay, and we want a lot of reverb on track seven, I would send just a little bit to A and a lot to B. And then we can also send a little bit of the snare to that same reverb. So I'll send more of track seven and a little bit of track two to the reverb. So let's trigger track. And that's how you can use return tracks and sends to save up on resources and have a more balanced effect processing in your projects. Then you can also insert MIDI effects. Head over to the MIDI effects category and on the right side of the browser, choose one of the MIDI effects to use. MIDI effects will only be applied on MIDI tracks with devices on them. You can't drag and drop a MIDI effect onto an audio track. So let's head over to the analog which is a MIDI device, and using the pitch plugin. So even if we recorded any MIDI, we can change the pitch or transpose the performance that we have simply by just going up and down the pitch on the MIDI plugin. We can add our pageators, chord plugins, and all different types of MIDI plugins that affect the actual MIDI performance for that device. So now let's talk about arrangement. Currently, right now in the session view, the clips that I, you see triggered or enabled are the ideas that I've put down for each in the individual track that make up the overall idea. So let's just say this is the chorus or the vibe that I'm working on. And so if I hit play, we'll get to hear all the different clips triggered at once and working simultaneously together. Now notice that you don't need the clips to line up together in order for them to play together. Just simply click whatever clip that corresponds inside that track and it plays along with any other tracks that have clips in them. But you can also line up the tracks together to arrange within the session view. And if you put all the clips that you want to be playing together in one row, that's called a scene. Head over to the master fader and trigger the play button here and that launches the whole row and which is called and that launches the whole row which is called the scene 
So maybe you want to say that'll be my chorus beat. I can rename that and type chorus beat. You can duplicate a whole scene by just hitting Command D, and that'll duplicate that whole row. And so let's say in this time, for this scene, we don't want to have that crazy lady, and we don't want to have the horn stabs. And now you can go back and forth between the first scene and repeat the whole process. Maybe even start off with not having anything at all. Maybe take away the kick snare and the 808 on the top. And then introduce the next section. And so on. That's how you can do some quick arrangement within the session view. But whenever you've gotten all the clips together or the overall idea, you can simply transfer and work in the arrangement view to flush out the arrangement by just simply hitting the global record button. The global record button will allow you to record and transfer any clip that is being currently triggered into the arrangement window. So let's pick a starting point. Let's say bar 17. We'll hit the record button. And what you'll start to see is that Ableton Live will record the current clips that are playing in the session view into the arrangement view. Whenever you're ready, you just hit the stop button and that'll stop the recording process. So now that I've hit stop, we've got the clips sent over here, but yet they're still grayed out. What's going on is that Ableton Live is still playing the clips in your session view. So you're still jamming out, so to speak and you're not ready to commit to an arrangement. But when you are ready to commit to the arrangement that you have here, simply hit the back to the arrangement button, which is located right here. That will disable all the clips that have been triggered, and now you can focus in on the arrangement. Notice now that when you hit play, and if you're starting from here, you really don't hear anything until the playhead moves over to bar 17. And since all these clips were set to loop mode, you can just simply select all of them and drag them as long as you want and arrange any way you'd like. So let's say we want nothing but maybe the sub to start the song with some hi-hats. And introduce the kick at bar five. Maybe have the snare come right in at bar nine along with everything else. Once you've committed to the arrangement view, you can simply just continue to add on to the arrangement by just enabling a track and recording it. So let's say we wanted to put a synth line. So I'm gonna hit the record button. Now I'm recording directly on to the arrangement view. The editing takes place the same way. Double click a region and the MIDI editor shows up on the bottom. You can also drag and drop into your arrangement from the browser or anywhere on your computer as well as your session view. Simply click any clip while holding it down, hit the tab button and drag it over into your arrangement view. Or go to your browser and drag files directly onto your arrangement view. Depending on the type of file, it would create a track to host that file and it would appear in your project. You can also, vice versa, send an arrangement in case you started from the arrangement view first into your session. So let's say I want this four bar region of the arrangement to be sent to the session view. Just highlight that section and right click and choose consolidate time to a new scene. This will go ahead and send a brand new scene, as you can see here, with those elements highlighted from the arrangement. And you can go ahead and trigger that whole scene by clicking the scene in the master fader. Once in the arrangement view, there's a couple tools that you can use to shape the arrangement to the way you like it. For instance, when working with regions that are set to a loop, you simply just drag and that track will extend for as long as you like. Because this is a four bar loop, the pattern will loop for after four bars. If I took the loop button off, that means I can no longer drag it to the right because it's just a four bar audio clip. 
if I wanted to copy it and have it played somewhere else, I would either have to copy it or duplicate it, or you can just hold the Option key and click and drag it anywhere you'd like in the arrangement. But that means that I can't drag it to the right or to the left because it's just a four bar loop. If I, if I enable the loop mode, I can now just drag over to the right or to the left and it will continuously play wherever that four bar loop is at. You can also split that region to create independent regions. So if I just say, well, I only want one bar, I'll select this one bar and I'll hit command E. I now have created an independent region. So like if I go ahead and transpose this, that transpose won't affect this region over here. Same thing, if I hit reverse to reverse the kick, it won't affect this region here. So splitting regions allows it to become independent and not affect any other regions within that track. You can also group tracks. So if we have the kick, snare, and the hi-hat, and these are all drum elements, I might want to create a group that I call drums. So I can hold shift and select multiple tracks, right click, and choose group tracks. You can also use the short key command. Now I've created a group where all these tracks are in. Let's go ahead and name this track drums. Because you can also create subgroups. And we'll call this the rest of the stuff music. And then if I wanted to, I could even group those groups. Just highlighting those two and creating another group. And call this track one. So you can group within a group as much as you like, and this will help organize your arrangements so it's a little bit easier to navigate through. This also makes it easier for when it comes time to mix to actually go ahead and affect multiple tracks by just inserting and dragging and dropping audio effects onto the group channel. Another essential element within creating the arrangement is the automation. Now automation is the ability to just draw in or record and program specific changes in a device, plugin, or effect. So automating in Ableton Live is really quite simple. So here on this snare track, we have a filter. Just simply click on any parameter, let's say the filter frequency, right click on it and hit show automation. That will enable the automation window in the Ableton Live arrangement window. Now everything's a little grayed out and you see the red dotted lines. That's indicating that no automation has been recorded, programmed, or drawn in. So you can simply just click, drag up and down, and you can see how it corresponds with the actual device. So let's say at this point, I want the filter to start at, at 208 hertz. And then just simply click another point and change the parameter. Let's say you wanted it to go back down at this point in the arrangement. Or well, there you go. So let's go ahead and play that and see how it works. Now you can see the filter starts to build up right and following the automation and then filter its way back down. You can also make smoother curves by holding the option key and a little bend icon shows next to your mouse cursor. Clicking that allows you to make concave curves. You can do it upward or inward. You can view multiple aspects of each device by just simply hitting the plus sign and choosing another device, another part of that device, such as LFO amount. And now you see the different parameters that you're currently automating. You can also click here in this box and choose what device and inside that device, which parameter you would like to automate. Let's say the slope. Now that's the one you're focusing on. And you can repeat the same process. If you wanted to record additional information on something that you recorded in the arrangement view, simply enable the overdub button by hitting the plus sign in your transport bar. And then recording. And that will add additional notes to your arrangement. You can 
consolidate both of the new pieces by hitting Command J, and then edit the notes in your MIDI editor. You can also loop a specific portion of your arrangement by enabling the loop bracket. Turning that on will loop that specific section. And you can change the length by just extending the bracket or shortening it. Next to that, you'll see the punch in and the punch out. This allows Ableton Live to simply record once the playhead reaches the beginning of that loop bracket and then leaves the loop bracket. So let me give you an example. It starts to record and it will end recording once it leaves that loop bracket. Be sure to take the loop bracket off or else it will just continue looping or recording in a loop. The other controls that you see in the transport bar have to do with the capture feature which allows you to actually capture performance without actually having to hit the record button. So if you're playing the chords or you can simply hit the capture button and Ableton Live will capture what you've played without actually having to hit record. Great feature, especially if you're just experimenting and trying to get a vibe. Next to that, you have the overdub button for your session view. This button allows you to add additional information like we just did in the arrangement view, but in your session view. And if you change any automation that's already been written, you can always hit this to go back to the original automation that you've placed in the arrangement. Now the last thing I want to highlight is being able to MIDI and key map devices in Ableton Live. And that is simply meaning that you can use your MIDI devices to control plugins, effects, since basically any parameter in Ableton Live with external devices and your computer keyboard. Simply go to the right hand corner and hit the MIDI box. Anything that's shaded in blue, you can go ahead and map. But one thing to keep a note is you want to make sure by going to the preference window and hitting the MIDI tab that your MIDI controllers, such as the one that you're using, have the remote section turned on. That will allow them to be a remote, meaning that you can use that to trigger the device. Once you have that enabled, go ahead and open up the MIDI mapping, click on a parameter, and then choose that device. Once I have that mapped, you'll see the number there, and it'll also show up in your MIDI mapping menu. You can change the devices, such as I, the minimum and the maximum parameter change. Now, let's go ahead, leave the MIDI mapping, and I can now use my MIDI device to control that remotely. You could do the same thing by enabling the key box, and that will allow the computer keyboard to do the same exact thing. I'm going to go ahead and assign the LFO to my number keypad 5, and exit the key mapping. And now every time I hit the number pad 5, that will affect that parameter. So that's going to wrap up our comprehensive crash course into Ableton Live 10. As you can see, we barely scratched the surface, and it can get really deep down the rabbit hole. But what we've covered in this essential walkthrough are the fundamentals and the basics that you're going to need to get the ideas that you have in your head out there to the world. You've learned how to record your music, how to actually program your music, and arrange it, and add effects to it to getting it to sound the way you want it to. I definitely recommend that you revisit this walkthrough from time to time just to brush up on some of the basics and just practice using this as an instrument. The DAW that you're currently using to record your songs is an instrument in itself. And so the more you practice and more become familiar with it, the better you're going to become at becoming efficient in getting your songs completed. And as I mentioned earlier, my gift to you for watching this video is a sample pack that I've put together filled with construction kits, loops, sounds, one shots, transition effects, everything you need to really hit the ground running and creating music right away can be found in this sample pack. It's yours absolutely free. And the bonus is it's royalty free. So you can use it in any DAW and any of your projects today. The sample pack also covers a wide range of different genres of music. So whether you're creating pop, urban records, or EDM, you'll find things in there that can help inspire you and hit the ground running. Simply click the link below in the description box or visit www.beatacademy.com slash pack and download your Beat Academy sample pack absolutely free today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>